it. So we're going from big to small, and after lunch, we're going to have two wonderful case studies of how they've implemented these things and what successes they've had inside their companies or corporations. So our next speaker is Dr. Mike Grigg. I've known Mike for at least a year. <laughs> a long time. I think, were we in grad school together? Just missed, yeah. So, yeah, so just a year, right? And uh, as soon as we came up with this topic and thought about the whole business um, approach right away, we thought of Dr. Patrick Newman's lab and Michael's work um, together. And they're going to drill down into looking at how MSD affects both quality and productivity. Okay. Yeah. So it's. We're diving down here. Um, Mike has had a, an interesting career. You worked for Chry Chrysler, right? Yeah. Uh, before going back to school. That's not in his bio, I don't think. <laughs> That's insider information. Um, but Mike has won some wonderful awards in the last couple of years. He's won some best papers in the Ergonomics Journal. And last year, you received the Early Career Researcher Award from the International Ergonomics Association. So great pleasure to have Mike speak with us, and then we'll have lunch. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, good morning. I got the enviable time slot just before lunch. So I will try to keep things moving right along, uh, but I don't know, maybe, maybe selfish as well too if I think I'm saying something valuable. Um, so yeah, as Jack said, I, I did work for Chrysler a bit before that. I'm a kinesiology background, so I, I'll give you a context of where I'm coming from on things, and I am going to try and stretch our boundaries a little bit here today. So um, I think there's some good touch points for everybody, but I guess time will tell. Um, so yes, I'm a kinesiology person, got into occupational biomechanics, ergonomics, spent some time at Chrysler, which was a great time in the field, in the industry, looking at that business side of it that I don't really know as well, and changes happen and things like that. And uh, in that experience, I ended up coming back around uh, to going to Dr. Newman's lab um, at uh, Ryerson University of that point, it's now Toronto Metropolitan University or TMU. Um, and part of that for me was maybe addressing my own insecurities of how to work with engineers or whatever, but I thought certainly to give, uh, get into that field and so I went into industrial engineering, um, I better understand that mindset and kind of then a lot of the work that's done in this lab is how do we pull all of this good uh, stuff we talk about in here, all this, you know, ergonomics group, of which Jack said earlier, this is the choir. Um, how do we meld that well with system consideration, system design points? And we're going to get some small little overlaps here today with the other talks, and it, it's really good because I see them as good little hook points, connect points, and then expansion or jumping off points, right? Um, so we certainly had uh, in the previous talk there about our, our dual goals in ergonomics. Uh, and human factors, and I'm going to use human factors, human factors engineering, you know, human factors and ergonomics, all meaning one today. So if there's inconsistencies on the slides, that's some of them, they're baked into a slide that uh, maybe time got the better of me to correct. Um, but I very much now lean to option two on this, right? I focus in more a lot on the system performance and try to really hook into that side of it to help connect more so into businesses. And you'll hopefully see why on the journey we go through here over the next 45 minutes of um, looking for elevating uh, awareness, human factors ergonomics in the pro in, uh, in industry, um, making things better connect, and hopefully you know pulling in appropriate stakeholders. Um, and, and so some of these questions that I started to list here are me almost thinking out loud as I was putting this together. You know, these ideas of, you know, my opinion, and I think I would see and maybe glad to hear that it's improved since I've been there, is, you know, why is the uptake of this limited? The previous question before of like, you know, how do you raise that up to higher levels in your organization? So why is that? You know, what are some challenges with making connections, right? Myself, at times we were adversaries for some reason. Didn't win either way. I was either on the side of the worker or the side of the management. Um, and then can we look at a different way and better way to communicate this information to really uh, connect into it, right? So there's a lot of benefits of what we've done in ergonomics. 
we obviously the royal we here, right? Um, but it, you know, and in some ways, has there been almost too much success in that safety side of it, well-being side of it, that it starts to really have people just wall us in as that's that's where it is, right? Um, you know, a couple quotes I'll present here, it's sprinkled in throughout of this is research related stuff, right? We had uh, in some field work we did, person commented on the HF specialist as table and chairs guy, right? And even their own reflection was, uh, so somebody in a similar organization, most don't see you're gonna almost be on desk and chairs and injury prevention, right? And, and, and that's, you know, it's a very justifiable thought for some of them based on if you read this quote at the bottom from uh, Nancy Thibergeon and, and Patrick Newman um, about the irony of it is that all that great work that was done has been done to get in there, it allows the door open and in, then also starts to really direct you down to one hall and uh, you know sit you on a, in a sidecar is an analogy used in that case. All right, but as I say, I'm going to come back around to the performance side of it, and we'll look at some of those things and then and then move on from there. So, um, not quite a graph. I know Jack mentioned one graph in his talk there. There's like I just took that one out yesterday. <laughs> it's it's at the bottom somewhere, but we're getting uh, we'll be kind of close to it anyway. Um, this um, a research that. Uh, duels here, looking at the uh, group of papers and at the criteria for what happened from the system side of and what happened on the human side of it, right? And it was synergistic. If you were bad in the human side, you're usually bad on the system side. If you were good, you were good in both. And that's 95% of what they found in, I don't know what it is, how many papers that, 30, 40 ish papers, right? I think back a little while ago as well, we've gotten other good case studies as well. This is a paper of Abramson's around 2000 and it's out of Sweden. Um, and it was looking at changes that were made in, I know I can get corrected by people in the house here, um, but around handling, uh, I want to say more of that type of thing. Um, and they changed the ladle of uh, that handling procedure, right? 11 million Swedish, Crowns Kroner uh, investment came back with 5.4, 5.14 million dollars payback each year thereafter, right? And when they investigated more of the other benefits, 2% tied into the reduced of uh, direct sick leave cost, 98% quality productivity, right? They handled these things better. They didn't maybe spill things. Um, you know, the quality of product getting through was just better. Uh, more recently, in this kind of tangled web of a graph, uh, is work uh, by Matt Colas here that looked through literature and then tried to make these tendrils and connections between workstation related quality risk factors and system effects and the quality side of it. And then you see in the middle part are human effects that are you know, workload and fatigue. And through all the papers that they found, these connections, you can see a lot of that runs through the human into the quality side or straight through the quality aspect of it, right? So we're starting to get more things established to be able to talk about these connections, uh, which then helps to give, you know, this group some more information to maybe have conversations with whoever they're working with. And again, I'm sure there's not a lot of you surprised to see these type of results, right? Errors and kind of risk factors that are set up, right? So we're thinking, going again, how well is the person going to do, right? We all know what's gonna happen with these risk factors from a load perspective, whether it be positional angles, the actual physical load they have. And so this here is out of a system dynamics model. We're using relationships uh, from the literature of likelihood of probability of things to happen. Uh, as this work of uh, Mashal Farid did, uh, you, as she modified then these risk factor levels, you can see how that impacted the error uh, HEP, which is the um, error part of it on the left side, that not surprisingly, as these risk factor levels increased, the error comes along with it. And the rate of that changed as she's able to play with those different input factors and see the influence on how that rate of change in error making can happen. Right? Uh, Mad Subani went in and did some math modeling as well. And in this one here sort of looked at if the business just considered kind of risk factors without the human element in it and looked at the cost outputs uh, and looked at that alone, the 
kind of ends up with this flat uh, orange line at the bottom there that, you know, the cost index stays level with all that risk stuff. But as you started, as he started to add in those different human factors effects, which I believe included things like their presenteeism, what type of slowdown they'd have by staying on work as they started to go off, as they were off, that type of thing. You can see again, when that's being ignored, the true cost isn't represented, right? And you, know, you can call that gap in there uh, without considering it, you know, a phantom profit idea that you think that's what your profit would be with that orange line, but it actually is probably less than what you expect. And then as you start to add in more of these elements, you see how they, on the right hand, you know, kind of a quilt looking graph there, as peak load and cumulative loads factors start to come into it, you see the interplay they have of how those things start to contribute differently and the cost comes out that other side of it, right? Okay. So you'd look at this and, uh, you know, kind of think, what can you do that's actual about it? Uh, again, I'm trying to give a good perspective of these uh, relationships that are starting to be made here. Okay. So there's the information that we have that you certainly believe, okay, we can benefit the well-being side, we can benefit the system side, right? So with it, even now that knowledge, you know, why, why do we still not have that ability? Like if you sat down with those graphs uh, with a, a manager or whomever, I'm not sure what type of traction you get on that. Or at the same time, are they going to come to you and ask for certainly that performance side of it? Right? And so I, you know, we've got quite a range of people I, I understand in this room today. I'm sure you know, we've got managers, uh, we've got certainly, uh, you know, we've got workers, researchers, everything, the whole gamut. And all of you have different backgrounds and different perspectives you come from, whether educationally, life experience, things like that, right? So with trying to look then and just sort of talk briefly about how we start to think of things differently and presenting that information, you know, what are the type of people that you potentially work with, right? Thinking of their backgrounds, and I'm going to, uh, you know, make a bit of an assumption here that probably as you tend higher in the organization, you might start to get more people or more frequency of people working at that level with an MBA, right? That's probably a fair assumption. Um, which got me thinking of taking a, a look at, you know, what's out there for an MBA program. It's not an exhaustive look, but one that really targeted me was being at TMU a few years ago, there's an announcement that came up about their MBA program that is leading for performance and well-being. And I can remember thinking that's that's pretty cool. Now there's something we should be able to hook into, somebody that would really align with us. Um, I remember saying to Patrick, did you know about it? Were you involved with any of that? The answer was no and no, right? Okay, so you know, thinking about this talk and trying to think of, okay, who we're trying to talk to, so how do we need to orient our thinking, right? Uh, you can see some of the key tenants within the program, and this is not to, you know, just, you know, give a representation of what I see here on it. And you can see they have these four sort of components within it of diversity, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Not a huge thing jumping out at me yet in this leadership uh, for performance and well-being. Certainly diversity, right? There's a lot of talk uh, more so I hear now around the equity, diversity, inclusion stuff, which I think this is a room that does that and has been doing that for years anyway, if we're truly designing for everybody to handle everything and that's what we're looking at. Um, you get to that outer ring of that circle there, socially responsible for decisions, environmental stewardship, ethical corporate governance. You know, maybe we could get some things in there that might lend itself. So if we dive into it a little more, when I look through all the courses that were available, two of the 36 courses they had available actually used something that made me look at it and go, this is gonna have performance and well-being, right? One of the core courses, labeled the same as the whole program, another was one of six courses embedded in not surprisingly, human resources, right? That's where we often sit, uh, we being as an agronomist when you work in the field. And that course was called Mental and uh, mental Health and Wellbeing, right? Looking a little closer into that, that Leading for Performance Wellbeing course, uh, I talked about you know, key theories of leadership, uh, importance of self-awareness for effective leadership and social well-being. Not really jumping at me there to go what I'm thinking of when I'm talking performance. Right, certainly encourage you to think critically about leadership as both a practice and a field of study. S seems pretty standard for MBA type of uh, education. And then help you develop your abilities to lead and follow with resilience. Right, and we, I don't know what people's perceptions are with resilience, but I know uh, certainly in healthcare, through our pandemic, when they're talking about training our healthcare leaders for resilience, I'm sure that was less than 
uh, exciting one, it'll be like, just fix my workflow, please, right? Okay, so there, I don't know more within the course than that, but at least first blush, you get an impression of, here's, I thought, something we could really hook into, not quite there, right? The mental health and well-being one talks about how to flourish in the workplace based on positive psychology, right, with some six areas within that that are positive emotions, engagement, relationships, vitality, meaning, achievement, and again, resilience as a foundation to flourishing will be explored and resilient skills and strategies will be taught, right? So you can imagine how my excitement for something that said leadership with well-being and performance has waned ever so slightly. Okay? So if we step sort of down from this, right, I know we have some uh, engineers in the room uh, and I work in engineering here, so I have no problem talking this way about it. How many courses might you think an engineer actually gets in human factors and ergonomics? Not a lot. How many are required? Not a lot, right? Um, it's a paper uh, in SIA, which is an uh, engineering education one that uh, Nancy Black and some others that will be around here today and over the next coming days. 68% uh, of programs had no HFE keywords in the required courses. 66% did not have any elective courses. And these are your engineers that are designing your systems, your products, your all of that engineering type stuff. Right? The institution where I'm based in and have TA'd courses in, in mechanical industrial engineering, two courses. One's a first year design course, which is co-taught between with a, a design scientist who is fully on board with it, and then Patrick Newman takes the ergonomic side of it. That's the only time the mechanical engineers are required to have it. Industrial engineers get another course in industrial ergonomics. Otherwise, that's it in that group, right? And having worked with them, you know, certainly some of them believe it's common sense, but I sarcastically in my head say your common sense got you a 55 in your assignment. So, <laughs> um, doesn't mean though as well when I say that's for all engineers, right? I know we have certainly some that really glom onto it and you have that, that really hook into it. So for those I applaud, right? So then now when we look at what might happen to engineers as they get out in practicing field, uh, Grover uh, quite a while back there, looked at why do they not consider work environment? They don't have the time, don't have the knowledge, not surprising with the education that we talk, don't have the tools, and part of that, some of this room to shoulder is given tools that work, and they don't have the mandate, right? And I remember a conversation years ago I had with, I don't think I've seen them around, but they're probably around sometime over ACE, uh, where they said, Michael, why do engineers not consider it? And I said, let's think about, if you're an engineer and you have to design something like a blender, what are they going to tell you to do? Make it blend things, make me able to build it, make it robust, reliable, good quality. I'm five or six levels down and I haven't even talked about a human, right? And a lot of people's goals and objectives might be four or five items long, you're still not in that spot for consideration, right? So I have to start looking at then, you know, how can we find other way to bring those people on board or work within that to elevate our side of it, right? Last part in sort of this kind of education, what's available and things like that. Uh, the lab uh, where I am, we looked at one point with uh, myself, Patrick and uh, Corey Searcy looked at corporate social responsibility reporting. That's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, you know, there's some talks, uh, points mentioned in, in Jack's talk there where I was like, oh, I should have grabbed more information on this. But uh, we looked at how work environment was uh, reported in, like in that content of CSR re reporting. It's inconsistent, work environment doesn't have a good de definition even, right? So if you're wanting people to talk holistically about what probably I think most of this room would consider work environment, it's likely not gonna happen. So we went, made a very broad definition of it, a working definition that you see on the screen there. And if, certainly if you read it, it's very high level, all aspects of the design and management of the work system that affect the employee's interactions with the workplace. But then we backfilled that by going to the literature and looking at what are other dimensions within that that really mean that that is good. And we came up with 12 of them. And then we took those 12 and that whole definition and went back to the literature, uh, looked at those reporting guidance kind of uh, standards, guidance reporting documents, and um, scored all of those for each of those dimensions on a zero to four scale, right? So use that type of a table there, where if they had a little bit, maybe they got a zero, if they had something with qualitative, quantitative information, we gave them that 2L, 2T, 
and if they were you know, reporting well externally to everybody, um, had good comparison year over year data, like that type of recommendation in it, then they got a four. Right? So we looked across here. If that actually flew off well at the back, apologize if it doesn't. Um, no fours, we got some threes. We had two that really scored quite well. One's called the GRI, which is a global reporting initiative, and it has such a broad range of it, it just captures a lot of stuff. The other one was a uh, human resource management one, the ISO 3414, if I'm remembering correctly, scored quite well. And then only one of them actually covered all 12 of our dimensions, and that was around some sort of corporate reporting advice, and those were all very cursory leveled dimensions of work environment. So I know we sit in here and we're thinking, okay, Again, why are those upper level? Why are we not getting that hook in? Why are we not getting the buy in there? And is it really fair based on that information for us to say, why are they not coming to us? Yeah, okay. Right? And there is a bit of a lack of knowledge, a little, little bit of lack of, they don't understand that impact. And this quote here is actually the back end of the, back end of the quote that said, he's a table and chairs guy. The person then, after we work in this, says, I didn't understand how it impacted all our process. Right? So in our evolution of working multiple years with this company in our field work, and we start to point out these different touch points, suddenly, okay, wait, now, now we can get somewhere. And I'll start to show a little more now, because I'm going to talk here on, uh, you know, then, what do we have for existing language that we can use, or what type of things can we to try and bridge that gap? Right, so taking more of a business perspective of it, you'll hear people talk about their indicators, their metrics, and all of that stuff. So to orient you where I'm coming from out of a, a business journal here that's set up, we, we leaned on to get our perspective uh, on metrics. Right? Metrics consists of a specific measure with a standard for comparison and a context of use. And, and that, I heard the word context used in the previous talk as well, and context is important. Right? If you, uh, I don't know, happen to see the talk and go, oh good, metrics, the guy's gonna give me something to use. I'm not sure I really can, because of that last part, context. Context is key, right? For those unfamiliar with all the stuff that people might be talking around metrics, they, I know myself, when we started working, we had to be very clear on what we meant, because it could be the individual measure, it could be a cluster of measures, it could be the actual performance system, right? So getting oriented is key uh, as you start to think of this if you're looking on that business side of this. And they also have a bit of a typology to them, right? That there's a focus and a tense. Right? With your focus being something operational and something financial. Right? That's kind of key when we think of what type of ergonomics information are you trying to connect into that people are using metrics, which often, uh, if you heard the, if you can't measure, you can't manage it, is why they lean into this type of thinking, right? And then on that tense side of it, uh, outcome and predictive. And that's certainly something really good probably with information we have out Kiff. We're still working more so maybe on the predictive. Right? Do I hit the wrong button there? There we go. Right? So I'm now going to switch into more like some of the research we did here uh, just to set kind of the, it's based off a case study we had working with electronics, consumer electronics manufacturer. Uh, surprisingly a number of years ago, uh, but it was quite a lengthy uh, involvement with them, working alongside them where, you know, from a research perspective, uh, we use kind of, it's called an action research approach, this kind of participatory approach where we work within them uh, to help make suggestions, reshape, and as we do that process of reshape, we look at and reflect on what worked, why did it work, and we kind of, you know, then work through kind of those iterations of did it address what we want, what are we going to change again and move from there. Um, so when you think across an organization here, you can think a couple ways. This is going to be a little more production centric on that, but I am going to try at times to sort of sprinkle in and think about, say, healthcare, and we can try and think about system, uh, sort of uh, more of a service uh, side of it uh, when you look at kind of the, the logic behind it, hopefully. And you can see across the whole range that if we work really upstream here on a predictive side, you're at your development and design stage, and then you got kind of what's going on, and then you got the outcomes, right? If I kind of flip this on edge and give a little more context to it here, you know, when we talk about our human factors metrics and human factors stuff, we're getting more virtual at the top, 
And then our actual, like where you have kind of more your actual risk factors in place and your outcomes, if we think for this room, you know, your injury and, and that type of instance. But on the right hand side of this here, as we move from the strategy at the top down to the outcomes, is that the top, we got a little less information, the bottom, we get a little more complete. Right? Again, we go the leading through to the lagging. And what's kind of the other thing is we're trying to do when we know how we want to implement our changes, we don't want to react retrofit. The top is when it's easiest to do that. So top of the chain, easier to do, more difficult, more expensive at the bottom, and yet at the top is where we're less information, less resources, you know, that type of side of it, right? Right? And I kind of relate it here to some possible biomechanical indicators. If we go pure biomechanics side of it, at least, again, same thing, thin at the top, and then we get all this sort of rich text that now we're trying to like haul her back to herself a year ago, right? Okay, so in that as well, I'm gonna just, you know, sidestep ever so slightly. I've made it pretty simple of going leadings design, laggings, your outcome. But if you noticed in this path, I'll, I'll sort of flip back to it in a second here. It's not necessarily that way across everything. The leading for one becomes lagging for the other, leading for one, you know, which then that is a, that lagging's leading for the next. So if you think of how something might be chunked up of a design group is designing something. So we've got that leading that, uh, leading information of how we might ex anticipate things to go. And then a lagging could be a, like a risk factor that comes out of it. And that's kind of where that design person might step aside as the things get pressed into production and beyond. Well, now that leading indicator for the injury stuff we've talked about or those challenges or even maybe some quality things are the outcome from the risk factor. So you know, it's not just a straightforward uh, path we can go through this. And in our early reflections as we first got into this, um, this research, we actually sort of proposed what we thought we would be needing to really get indicators for human-centered manufacturing, right? And I've thrown a lot of the text on there because I know these slides are shared, so uh, you can certainly see those after. But these, uh, I believe it was eight propositions we have there, we talked, we thought you would have to be strategic with whatever metrics you have, right? So finding something strategic that relates specifically to the organization you're with. You wanna be able to have something that goes throughout that whole development process so we can continually keep that feedback going. Uh, we obviously need something in a virtual to be predictive if we really wanna be involved in that uh, de design and strategy level. Uh, in which case we need, might need some tools that are customized for that, right? It's good to have potential metrics maybe that reflect in on the design guidelines. We want people to do something, here's where the information you're giving them, can you actually give some sort of feedback in a way that indicates how well that process might be followed, how successful it was? And we want to then look into as well, connect that with design choices and strategies, right? So spanning that aspect of those design technical aspects of what might be going into the nuts and bolts of making equipment or process to what actually is relevant information for a person, human in the system to perform. Next to the one we have in here as well, thinking you probably want to look at considering integrating within existing measures. I'm sure most of you in your daily lives don't like when somebody comes in and goes, great idea, we're now going to do this in our organization. It's another task, right? But if they came in and married along nicely with what you're currently doing, likely a better case, it's going to naturally more flow in with you. Right? Like anything, we don't want to be static in the way we set our minds when we first evolve with this is a continually developing thing, certainly at the stage we're at in this field with metrics. So you want to have something where you're reflecting and, and revising on it. And at a very high level of it, it'd be good to have something that sort of looks overall how well is it globally, right? As we lift up to these macro business perspectives. Okay, so these were the ideas we thought we were running with a bit and where we would head with it. And then I hadn't really reflected too much on it this way, but um, when I now I'm gonna like talk through and sort of throw, show you when we looked at this specifically in our organization, how did that kind of shake out, right? So we went in at the company we're working with, again, I said they were electronics, manufacturing, consumer stuff. So they worked in the Pacific, you know, we were at was spinning up to produce, right? They had the device, whatever was that was to be developed. They were spinning up the production system. And we were wanting to look at, again, thinking of not why is an engineering lining up with human factors, 
but how is human factors lining up with engineering? Right? So we looked, as we were in there hanging along with them, we looked at sort of like the themes of the indicators and metrics that we saw, clustered them out of what they look like they would be kind of in a theme that's kind of simple yet comprehensive, and we end up with these four elements, which kind of relate to that typology I talked to a little earlier, right? They had a leading group, they had a status sort of saying how they were going, they had stuff that was coming out at the end of the system, and they also had another cluster that was looking at how well they were feeding back through the system. Right? So based all this off our engineering one, that was what drove this, and you see a few selected items here of what those were, like how they repaired things in progress as the way things are running, what their yield and scrap was coming out the other end of it, how they were responding to some of those system changes that they needed to to fix those issues. So anybody have an idea what's going to come on the next slide here when I talk about our human factors? About how, how, well we, how well that might have done in that one? Not great, but fair, completely as, as you would expect, right? Nothing really leading. We had a, one person look at us and go, I don't believe it, but if that's what you're telling me, I guess you're right. Um, so not a lot there, not a lot in the response, and as I would expect, very good on the how we doing right now and what comes out at the other end, injury-wise and things like that, okay? So you see we've got a gap here. We've got a gap in a couple things, what's covered. And even if you looked at those style of the style of information from the human factor side versus the engineering side, and so we end up with something here where we've got a bit of a different language that we also have to figure out how to address, right? Very tipped to the engineering side with lots of these informations, little touch points and things they can measure, report on, not quite the same on our ergonomics language. Step away from production ever so briefly here with a slide I, I, I threw in today. Um, some consideration for metrics in healthcare as well, right? And I want you to think of this one more in the, what is the information that is actually presented, right? So um, this, uh, this Fishbein uh, group looked at workload measures that were associated with direct care delivery in a tertiary healthcare setting um, and based it off, where's their source of information? Good thing to think of. And so a lot of that was coming out of the electronic records, right? So not surprisingly, the information they're reporting on it, right, um, tends to what you're going to actually log into those systems as they are made, right? And of those 30 papers, they found a range that talked at task level metrics, um, patient level, clinician level, and unit level. So, you know, kind of inside moving out again. Um, but those workload measures, they included things of patient turnover, number of patients going through, how sick those patients are, the acuity level of them, the nurse to patient ratios, and direct care time, right? So think of what information you, as an ergonomist, could actually contribute to those, right? That's, you know, we're looking to try and make that connection into that because that isn't exactly information we sort of sit around with. You know, and as a and brief aside on it, those type of the things are some more work we've got uh, that, uh, Sadim Qureshi has going in the lab. Um, we're, we're actually looking with a lot of those indicators on using event simulation modeling. So, you know, model out in computer world the, uh, the unit, run it through these simulations based on probabilities and how time things happen throughout the day, and then we can actually see these type of metrics come out. But we're also then sticking in with that human model to look at workloads. So then we can actually look at these simultaneous, and now we're starting to build that connection that allows us to give the information that we have with the business decision people, right? right. So in this experience uh, with our field partner, you know, we had our propositions earlier where we thought we might go. What we ended up coming out with are some recommendations for people trying to work in our domain for metrics and how to develop them, right? So, you know, we slightly rephrased ours part differently. We're looking at qualitative and quantitative information that can be related to a, a referent for comparison. And so what you want to do and we want to think about is where are the gaps that exist in the metrics and indicator information that you're trying to communicate with. So a bit of work here on positioning uh, or finding the key touch points. And I'm going to come after these, what's going to uh, follow after these recommendations I'm going to show you some different strategies that we were using uh, simultaneous to this investigation that sort of show how we would then determine where we were going with this stuff. Right. 
So looking for those gaps. Another one here, determine the motivation for metrics and indicators. The organization might have a, how much they really dive into it, an individual might have how much they dive into it, and if you start to align with their motivation, then you'll start to understand what type of context and where you need to go to support it, right? So um, you want to elevate to the next level, find out, and I'll give you the exact quote in a minute, find out what excites the person above, right? So at the same time then, look to the organization goals. So one, we're looking at their metrics, how they might want to report and their affinity for it. The next, what are the goals? And then how can you connect to those goals of the group as a whole or the individual, right? You want to support those different people at those different levels. But at the same time, you need an appreciation of what's their background for the information because you need to, you know, if I dropped on some of the people we worked with desk, a, here's the cumulative load profile of the low back and the shoulder um, for seven cycles. What do you think? We should fix that. Not necessarily going to register, right? Without either some education or, again, pivoting your thing. So understanding that audience rather than just throwing information at them and going, why is it sticking, why is it sticking? But knowing perhaps what would be the reason it may or may not stick. Um, it comes then around is matching the style. We worked with some individuals who would say, give me the red, yellow, green. You can debate whether how much we actually like that idea, but uh, that's what they wanted, that's what they needed. We had some other people say, give me things in a hierarchical order that's just numbered. Some give me the shape, some give me straight numbers, right? Again, context and knowing who you're working with is kind of, when you think about it, designing metrics using human factors ergonomics principles as well, right? Um, also be mindful of where they're going to find ways to eliminate what you're thinking about. Uh, we had some, per, uh, some people I've talked to that kind of said that's, you know, when talked about serving individuals, they weren't a big fan of it because that was an individual's opinion and I fail to see what the difference is why that's not, not a good way to go, right? Uh, knowing what the person has as the comment was made, talk to your workers, figure out what they need. Very good source of information, right? Uh, and then as we confirmed as well that certainly create processes that integrate uh, within existing workflows, um, right? And some reflections, reactions that people we had to work with on it or sort of supported these recommendation, right? So if a boss isn't asking for it, less likely it's going to work. That kind of makes sense, right? If I'm not too interested in some things, I might not dive into bringing it. I really like this one from one person that they just, they were trying to design metrics in the organization themselves. And one challenge they found was they thought, I'm gonna bring everything in the room, we'll just sort it all out, and it'll all just coalesce down to a nice point, and it just kind of starfished, I think, every which way. But when I talked about what they would do individually, they basically responded, whatever my manager likes, I'm excited about. I'm fascinated about. Right? Right, and really, it's like, what are you doing to make the person above you, their job better? Right? So, talked about different things we've seen, maybe things to think of when you go to connect, how we go about to do it, or how we tried to go about to do that, or what are some approaches. I'll just show over these next few slides as we start to move, hopefully for time, right? Uh, Judy Village, as some of you may or may not know in the room, um, you know, her, her theory that, grounded theory that came out of all the research work that she did in this, you know, talked, had sort of these three sections within it here of, one, your human factor specialist acclimates to understand What's, what's relevant to people, what's important, what is the engineering language needed. Um, I talked with one person once and said, oh, you know, um, we were talking with them about, okay, how are you gonna get into this engineering design stuff? What's a key step? What's a good meeting they have? And they said, I don't know when any of your meetings are, right? right? So you can't exactly contribute if you can't be at the table or even to know and find a way to get in. Some people open the door quite willingly, others will stand with their foot in front of it. Um, but you then have to sort of reposition and find the good way to get involved, right? But as that individual's and people's knowledge, as we saw, started to increase of the other processes in the organization, the way then that we could work with them to help create information better aligns, other people start to realize it, see the benefit, and then suddenly that person was actually getting called to come and help. Uh, and then at that point then, as other people higher up, they started to hold the ones accountable below that reported to them for that information. Um, and, and then any adaptation and, and further uh, integration ensues. So how might you do some of this? Well, 
first thing we'd always talk about is we do a process scan. So at a very high level here, uh, some work by Eileen Lim, a master student that when I went to put the date on this, I gasped at what I thought was only a few years ago um, because I was there at the same time as her. You know, kind of like us, Jack, only a year ago, where one's the factor times 15 or whatever. But um, and some key things that, 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 and this might be neat for any of you considering it, looking for these touch points of how to bring that information in is one, sort of mapping out the sequence logic flow of how all of these organizational processes happen. And on that right hand side is the key people and what they span within that. So you know who's a relevant individual that you need to find out what excites them as a manager and then how you can find that supporting information for them. If you want to drill in a little more on the detail we have here, you can then bust out those individual sections and start to really look at even more specific integration points if this is time-based of, I need to have information here at this date, this is the key stuff they need to make these decisions, and suddenly now you're starting to roll a bit with, with how you start to move to the next level, like, okay, can I get the information, what do I need to get that? And I'll show you then how our, uh, we worked with the organization um, when Judy uh, Village overlays a bunch of things we developed in line with everybody there. So again, sort of flip this process on its side here that we start with a product design on the left-hand side, how the products get realized, how they start to design, they can ma make it, figure out the assembly line, and then eventually on the far side kind of launch it and they push it out to whoever was going to build things. And so with that process that I've talked about here, uh, our group worked with them and actually develop these different human factors ergonomics tools that would support those different levels, right? Tweaked our information, matched it up with engineering tools that they had, so such things as a, if you're familiar with the PFMEA, so a process failure mode effects analysis, where they look at how, what are gonna, what's gonna wreck my process and how bad is the fallout going to be, essentially, is the easy way to explain it. And we tweaked that to bring in sort of the human element to it, right? Further on, you know, people designing fixtures didn't really have some a good uh, structure for the targets that needed to have, so put something in place for that. Gave that a nice little score at the end that as they reviewed that, you could say, you're on a good path or you've got a lot of issues to still sort it out. And then even just even, uh, you know, away from kind of metric side of it, but you could still report out on it, some different little uh, things and like how lessons learned are captured and how those are all fed back through it. All right, so you're still trying to reach out to people here. You're still trying to understand what they need. Certainly sitting down with talking to people, finding space to talk with them is great. Uh, Judy actually sat down and did some cognitive mapping, if you're not familiar with it, but sat down with managers and said, tell me what's really important to you. We had people that said fatigue and quality. She said, okay, well, tell me what drives your quality. And they'd stay, say, stay at that next level. Okay, what actually supports the ability to do that? And sort of worked out levels from that and at the very end, this was I think a merging of about seven different managers, they knew they liked, they were concerned about fatigue, they knew they wanted quality, but now then you've got these paths and tendrils where all of a sudden they're like, oh, that connects, that connects well, and we need to fix that up, all right? A little more simple graph of it here, showing, you know, top left is things that improve quality, and in the heart of it there's fatigue, and you see things running through fatigue, feeding out into quality, and that realization happens, all right? Good. So they might understand, they might the connection, you know what information you need. As I say, we don't necessarily have all the tools, which I challenge uh, people in this room to help develop. One step we took that helped to give us our information and metrics is we looked at a person working at a workstation, what do we know about them, what do other people want to know about them? And we knew that the person sitting there, they're moving their hand around, they're kind of walking around the station with their hand. We know we can start to figure out how long that's going to take, we can do use time and motion study prediction information to get an estimate of how time was. And I was surprised, I was working with somebody in their development group and I was like, here's what we can do and we can give you a rough idea about how much time that takes. And they're like, wait, you can predict time, right? So even some in their own group didn't know that that's something that we pulled out of the engineering side of it. And as so we started to mash all that up together and find out what would key inputs be, and in this case, key inputs being things about uh, in the tool we had, we could sit a different style of person at a known distance from the desk, measure hand location, and use that time interval, and now we can get outputs here that talk about our traditional risk load levels, uh, how much they might be moving around, 
um, and, and that aspect of it, how, what's their kind of reach acceptability, and simultaneously what was important for the people designing at that stage was how long are things going to take, right? We've got a gap still to go to fill beyond there that could be and the errors would be or the likelihood of error would be. So I challenge somebody in the room to work on that one, please, and thank you, right? We use then as well design principles, human factors design principles to design how we communicated that information. We had a manager who was great. He sat down, he's like, I love all the data you have. Of course, me being the biomechanics style nerd side of it, had a humongous table off to the side and we're like, they are not gonna care about that. And so we found a way to like synthesize or combine it and the manager's like, and I want you to give me top three issues. I work on Pareto's, it's like, give me top three, we'll knock those off, next top three come up, right? Valued information for them that supported the person above that then gives them a way to go, okay, this is what I want, I like it, let's get it involved, right? A brief aside on that one as well, with all the researchers in the room, this same manager, when, uh, um, when somebody made the comment, it's like, but this tool we developed, it's not risk validated, it's not validated, reliable, all that testing done, and he's like, I don't care. I've got comparison one, comparison two, to me those are considered canceled out. Let's, let's, let's get moving on things. I can't wait for your three years to validate it, right? So it's something to keep in mind and it's something I certainly know myself personally as an anecdote in engineering, have learned, uh, I'd say the way it is on it and it's, it's a good way to go. In light of better information, this is what we're using with now, right? And you just hope that a, a tool you've developed, people use it in the appropriate scope uh, and in the way you intended. Uh, other ways to, to look at developing metrics that can help in talking to the organization is how well are they actually doing from the human factors perspective, right? So another one we worked in concert with them was capturing the quality of human factors across their organization, right? To give them a score of like, we believe this is your ideal, you are nowhere near that ideal and the other ideal, right? So again, take a big organization, make it down into edible chunks, we look at functions in the organization, what drives that function to be what we think is a, the high level for human factors and give you a score uh, that then you can sit down and talk with somebody. Right? Information from a manager on that type of thing was this kind of thing, it was this is good, I at least have something I can go talk to somebody else about with it, right? I have something tangible to sit down and say, this, uh, we'll, say we'll call ourselves experts, this expert said this, we're at this level, they say we should be at this level. Let's start moving there. What we still need in these type of things, right, is what's the cost, cost and return on that, right? Because his thing was, if I'm going from a one to two in one category and it costs me $6 million and I get minimal benefit, I don't want to do that. But if the benefit's there, they'll gladly do it, right? right. And the way we sort of, again, as I, with the rest of that tool there, we bust out those different functions in it. We score it across any of these different elements, right? So you'd relate it in this type of way here, sort of from a zero to hero scale on it, um, and then sum across for the whole thing and then your score comes out of it, all right? So a little different take, anyway, I've gone here on the MSD part of it, right? Trying to work to that other side, to the performance side of it. Um, you know, part of me is like, this could be, Something, certainly something different for the room, and I was like, I'm gonna stand on the edge of that MSD bubble to everybody and say, let's just hold hands for a second, take one step out, and let's look at it from a different perspective here. And that's kind of where I was hoping to go with that, and I thought it's a nice little build off what Jack talked about more. Um, so really, after that, it's kind of like, so what do you think? We've got a little bit of time here before lunch, right? Still a little hunger for knowledge, not hunger for lunch just yet, <laughs> or hunger for discussion. And that's really, you know, when I, finish up on one of these things, it's like, let's have a, we're still a society that can have civilized discussion, I think, certainly in Canada, because we're so nice. Um, so uh, what do you think? Anybody want to, you know, certainly comments, questions on that? Please step to the microphone. I'm Allison Stevens, uh, oh, yes. currently at Fanshawe College, but 30 years in uh, Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. That takes about 30 years to do, yes. I guess, but it's right on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so my message is it is right on. It's a ton of work, yeah. but it will pay off. 
right? It will get there. It is a great map. Um, I don't even know how to add to little bits of it because literally that took 30 years to A, figure out that I was talking a different language than the engineers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was talking force frequency posture and they were like, uh, yeah, I gotta go build my car, right? So, um, you know, I guess the, yeah. So take it slowly, start where you are, find out I loved your statement of make your boss look great, right? Figure out what is important to them and then get your agenda on their metrics. I guess one of the big changing points for me is every engineer at Ford Motor Company on their performance review has a requirement to do ergonomics. That's measurable, mm -hmm. not just do ergonomics and be a good engineer. It is, you will launch with zero red ergonomic issues by this milestone, mm -hmm. right? Okay, that took 20 years to get that on the performance review. So again, I know there was a lot in there. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, dude, that's, yeah, we did, yeah. So there was a lot in there, but it's really, it really good. So thank you. Yeah. I, it was it, lovely may, to hear that. May I ask a question of you? You sure can. Those engineers, when they had that added to them, how did they react? Um, I had a lineup of engineers that had been ignoring me for months. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I became very popular on shit. I actually have to listen to you. What, what do we got to do? Right. How do, I, how do I achieve, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're trained to achieve. And in most cases, it wasn't that they didn't want to do ergonomics in the first place. It was just extra and being nice to the ergo team mm -hmm. yep. versus... Uh, yeah, okay, this is going to affect my performance rating, which affects my pay and my raise and what I got to do for the Zergo thing. Yeah. yeah. So, and, really and I noticed that, like, that shift in that time I was there a little bit, um, just the way some other were progressing. Um, uh, Kevin Gillespie, pretty, I followed his wake into... No, not wake being a bad thing, it was just the space that uh, getting into when I was into Chrysler. And it's certainly more people around that time were trying to find a way to 